I think one of the reasons that we age, that we become chronically ill, is because we don't eat enough meat and organs. And I will let that stand in stark contradistinction to what the longevity community claims to be ideal for living long and well. Straight up works. Check out this review on Whole Package. This kind of stuff makes me so happy. The context to this review is a major key, so I'll start there. I'm a cancer survivor. I went through five cycles of chemotherapy with spinal injections followed by radiation treatment, all at the age of 16. Prior to starting all that treatment, I was informed that a very possible consequence to all of it would be infertility. Possibly I could not have children someday. I was given the option of putting some sperm on ice, but considering my age and the years I would pay for storage, I would have the cost, that would cost a fortune to go that route. I accepted the risk and came through treatment with a clean bill of health and have now been cancer-free for many years. Fast forward to 2022, seven years into a marriage with my beautiful wife, we had tested my sperm levels multiple times in the last few years. All of the results essentially said it was probably not going to be possible for us to conceive. All in all, we were sad about that reality, but again, but again, accepting, a, but again, accepting of it, and we loved the idea of adopting down the road. Early this year, I started an animal-based diet thanks to my wife's advice and Dr. Paul Saladino's content. I started taking whole package from heart and soil supplements for a couple of months and we started trying for a baby, figuring we would give it a try before pursuing adoption. Literally less than a month later, my wife blindsided me with the incredible news that she was pregnant. We just found out that we were having a baby girl. I am beyond grateful for heart and soil supplements and this amazing supplements. It straight up works. That's amazing, guys. You can find whole package and all of our grass-fed, grass-finished supplements at heartandsoil.co. I'm so excited and I'm so glad people are benefiting from what we're doing and sharing reviews like this with me and with all of you. In this week's podcast, I want to talk about an email that I got from a fan. And that fan said to me, paraphrasing, is there a contradiction between vitality and longevity? Is it possible, Paul, that all of these things you suggest will make me vital and virile in the short term, but shorten my life? So in this podcast, I talk about longevity on an animal-based diet. I address caloric restriction, the true data there, what we know from mouse and monkey studies and human studies, what we know about mTOR and what we know about leucine and methionine, because there are so many in the longevity community that have the same concerns as this individual. Yes, meat and organs will get you strong, get you ripped and get you vital and libidinous, but they will shorten your life, these people say. And if you listen to bastions of medical science like the Mayo Clinic, they'll say, red meat will shorten your life. So listen to this podcast if you want my take on this, because I don't think these things are true at all. And I think I can make a very strong case here that this is misleading and that you are so much better off long-term, including meat and organs, either fresh or desiccated, like we make it hard in soil, in your diet for your long-term longevity, and that those of us doing this will far outlive and be much more vital and virile long into old age than those obsessed with caloric restriction and avoiding leucine and we're hoping to pull as many people from the longevity community over because they need to benefit from this as well. In the video for YouTube, I had to do the quick change because I want to show you that the kale is bullshit, the seed oils are bullshit shirts are now available. If you want to help me spread the message to the world, you can go to kaleisbullshit.shop. We've got hats, we've got hoodies, all kinds of good stuff. All right, guys, that's it. On to the podcast. Enjoy this one. Is there a trade-off between optimal muscle mass, energy, body composition, libido, quality of life, and longevity? This is a question that was posed to me recently in an email. And I think it's a question that is prominent in the longevity space. So I wanted to do a podcast addressing this question and my thoughts on this. And I'll share a bunch of research that I think supports my position. But I wanna start by showing you guys this email that I got from someone through Hard and Soil. So the person says, I've been consuming a lot of your content lately, taking copious amounts of meat and organs. Thanks for making an effort, et cetera. Uh, at the beckoning of a family member, I've also recently considered some perspectives from the longevity community, which of course has some different conclusions about a healthy diet than you. Here's a question. In short, I'm wondering if some subtle comments you've made indicate that you think an animal-based diet will lead to a more robust, vital life. Sounds pretty good, right? But not necessarily increase longevity in the way that longevity communities approach will. So this is the email that I'm reading, which emphasizes caloric restriction, dietary restriction, 
and restriction of certain amino acids. I'll get into those in the podcast, specifically leucine and methionine. So here's my question. The person says, would you agree with the notion that longevity approach may potentially lead to more years in someone's life, but that it will come at the expense of vitality in those years since the diet is centered on restriction rather than the vitality that we know (laughs) comes from the nutritional abundance of an animal-based diet? So that was a cool email that I got from someone that was kind of the genesis of this podcast. So where, where do we start here? Well, I thought I would start by sharing the longevity community's perspective. So I'll share a clip of David Sinclair, who I've had on the podcast in the past, and then I'll talk about what mainstream medicine says with a clip from the Mayo Clinic. So here's David Sinclair on Lex's podcast. But uh, getting to the bottom of this, what I think is going on is that just like testosterone and growth hormone, you will get temporary, maybe not temporary, uh, immediate health benefits. You'll feel great, you'll get more muscle, energy. But the problem is, I think it's at the expense of long-term health and longevity. So that that short clip basically summarizes uh, David Sinclair's position, and I'll, that's what we'll be talking about in this podcast. It's interesting that he admits that there are clear immediate benefits by eating things like meat and organs, uh, improvement in energy, body composition, libido, we all know this. And from my perspective, the longevity community has now sort of changed their tune to say, oh yeah, but, but, that, but that's going to hurt you long-term. That's going to take years off your life. So that's what we'll talk about in this podcast. And then what does mainstream medicine say? I'll share this clip from the Mayo Clinic, and then we will go into Um, all of the data and research that I've gathered for this podcast, sharing my opinions and reactions to these thoughts from these perspectives. Researchers at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona decided to find out if eating red meat affects a patient's mortality. Does it shorten your life? Uh Uh-oh. In a review of six large-scale studies that tracked more than a million and a half people for periods ranging anywhere from five and a half to 28 years, Researchers found that a diet that includes red meat raises the risk of developing cardiovascular disease and cancer, as well as health problems like diabetes and high blood pressure. Their review was published under the title, Is Meat Killing Us? So, with regard to this snippet from the Mayo Clinic, all of these are epidemiology studies, which I've talked about in the past, but I'll address this directly in this podcast. But... It's pretty clear that the longevity community, as David Sinclair says, sees red meat as potentially something that can improve us in the short term, but doesn't think it's going to be good for us long term. And the Mayo Clinic Western Medicine shares this view. I think Mayo Clinic is a good representation of mainstream Western medicine's perspective. So we have both the uh, illustrious longevity community and the illustrious uh, ivory towers of Western medicine both saying red meat will shorten your life. Okay, what do I think about this? Let's dig into it, and what is the other perspective here? Most of you know, if you listen to my podcast or follow any of my work on Instagram or YouTube, that I disagree with these perspectives wholeheartedly. And let's begin with a consideration of the research in humans and in animal models of the three or four levers that the longevity community, quote unquote, would like you to pull to improve your longevity. These include things like caloric restriction, avoidance of mTOR activation. So mTOR is the mechanistic target of rapamycin. That kinase is activated by amino acids, especially branch chain amino acids like leucine, also potentially by methionine. So the longevity community would recommend that if you want to live as long as possible, you should avoid foods that are high in methionine and high in leucine and probably eat foods like lots of plants that are lower in those amino acids, and then you're going to get less mTOR activation. If you eat lots of plants and if you do lots of fasting, then perhaps you'll also get some caloric restriction. And that is how the longevity community believes that you will live as long as possible. So let's dig into what the research says about most of those pieces. And I will offer some perspectives that are not talked about very often. I will also note at this point in the podcast that I did ask David Sinclair to come back on the podcast to have some friendly discussion and debate about these things. 
he's been unwilling to do it. This is um, just, I'll respectfully say this is kind of a frustration of mine and a disappointment of mine across all of the scientific community. There are many others in the scientific community that I've asked to come on the podcast to do uh, respectful discussions and debates, and they consistently decline. Um, those people involved in the sulforaphane world um, have also declined. Uh, even those people on the other side of the plant defense chemical discussion won't come on the podcast. One of my friends was recently on Rogan, and he decided he didn't. He wouldn't even come back on my podcast to have a discussion about plant defense chemicals. I don't understand why people are shying away from these types of debates, but. Uh, it's a little frustrating to me, and I think that there is a developing um, echo chamber in in these communities. And of course, we're all guilty of a bias. But I've really hoped in the past to have more of these discussions on the podcast. But it's been very difficult to get these people to actually engage in these discussions. So, with that being said, let's talk about caloric restriction and go from there. So, one of the people who's done a lot of work in this space in animal models, uh, I believe he works with dogs, is Matt Caberline. And Matt Kaberlein and his group recently wrote an article in Science, a preeminent journal. And the title of the article is Anti-Aging Diets Separating Fact from Fiction. And you'll see here, even just looking at this abstract, that the data is really not as cut and dry or as clear regarding the benefits of caloric restriction as many in the longevity community would like you to believe. So um, the group with Matt Kaberlein in this abstract in science say laboratory studies throughout the 20th century established and confirmed the benefits of caloric restriction in multiple model systems. Caloric restriction not only increased lifespan across evolutionarily distant organisms, but also reduced age-related diseases, burden, and functional decline in these studies. Epidemiologic data from human populations also generally consistent with the idea that lower caloric intake is associated with increased life expectancies. In numerous years, numerous in recent years, numerous diet modalities that are purported to be anti-aging have sprung from these observations. These diets restrict particular macronutrients, either carbohydrates or protein, and feeding intervals can be modulated as well. They say human studies, both correlative and controlled, are consistent with health benefits conferred by a calorie-restricted diet. However, and this is a very important however, it remains unresolved whether these benefits are a consequence of the modulation of the aging process itself or simply the result of avoiding obesity. Several unresolved questions suggest caution when considering whether to recommend or implement any of these diets among the healthy general public. Among these is the understanding of how genetic and environmental variation modify diet response, especially in understudied populations and in the context of environmental challenges, such as, for example, a global viral pandemic. So in this article, they go on to talk about um, the way that these calorie-restricted diets are constructed, and they bring up many questions regarding the benefits of these diets and whether the benefits of these diets, as you heard as I was reading the abstract, are related to any particular mechanism of anti-aging or if it's just an avoidance of obesity. It's so important when we're thinking about medical literature and research to understand the context in which these studies are being done. And in human studies, or as you'll see in mice studies, or in primate studies with rhesus macaw monkeys, many of the benefits of these calorie restriction diets are found in animals that are unhealthy or in animals that are fed evolutionarily inconsistent diets. And those benefits evaporate when animals are fed evolutionarily consistent diets, which do not induce underlying obesity, chronic illness, and insulin resistance. So what I hope to be able to do with this podcast is provide an outlook for how you can be healthy. And I think that there are a group of you who are struggling with diabetes, obesity, et cetera. And for those people, I think there's a very clear path forward. It's something I've talked about many times in the past. It's avoidance of seed oils, avoidance of processed sugars, avoidance of garbage processed foods, focusing on an animal-based diet, which will lead to improved satiety and lead to improved weight loss. If you listen to the podcast I did a few weeks ago about how to lose weight, you know that I'm actually not a fan of caloric restriction if you are not improving the quality of your diet at baseline. I think that caloric restriction will fail long-term. But I think that the majority of the audience that listens to this podcast are people who are already pretty healthy. This person that emailed me is clearly tuned in. He's eating meat. He's eating organs. He's taking supplements from hard and soil. 
he's already healthy. Is calorie restriction, is methionine restriction, is leucine restriction going to benefit him? That is the key question we must ask. And it parallels many of the questions that I would challenge the mainstream medical community with. Is LDL a problem in people who are insulin sensitive? It's a very parallel type of questioning. Are meat and organs going to be a problem? Are they going to shorten your life? This is what we're really trying to understand. And as you can see, there are a lot of holes. We've only just scratched the surface, but there are a lot of holes in these arguments suggesting that they will or suggesting that in an otherwise healthy individual, you should limit these things for fear of shortening your life if you do not. There's another paper here that I really want to talk about. I found this one to be very interesting. The title is Rodent Diet Aids and the Fallacy of Caloric Restriction. It's by Alexander Wolf, and I will read a piece of the abstract. He says, health gains from caloric restriction depend on control mice being sufficiently overweight and less obese mouse strains benefit far less from caloric restriction. Pharmacological interventions that increase lifespan, including resveratrol, rapamycin, nicotinamide mononucleotide, and metformin also reduce body weight. These are things I've talked about in the past at length, and I've said I'm not a fan of any of these interventions for a healthy individual. I'll continue in this abstract. In primates, caloric restriction does not delay aging unless the control group is eating enough to suffer from obesity-related disease. Human survival is optimal at a body mass index achievable without caloric restriction, and the above interventions are merely diet aids that shouldn't slow aging in healthy weight individuals. Caloric restriction in humans of optimal weight can be safely declared useless, since there is overwhelming evidence that hunger, underweight, and starvation reduce fitness, survival, and quality of life. Against an obese control, caloric restriction does, however, truly delay aging through a mechanism laid out against an obese control, caloric restriction does, however, truly delay aging. So one of the things, if you've listened to my content in the past, you may be aware of is that many of the studies done with resveratrol were done in mice that were obese, that were made obese, either genetically or through their diets. So do we have a study that shows that resveratrol is of any benefit to humans or animals that are otherwise healthy? We do not. This is what we must be very careful of in medicine. Yes, for the general public that is eating garbage, caloric restriction is a great thing. If people are eating processed foods, they should probably eat less of it. And we know from experiments that if you want to do a calorie-restricted diet of purely Twinkies, you will lose weight and become healthier and become more insulin sensitive. I have major concerns about your long-term health, vitality, hormonal health, micronutrient status, eating a diet of exclusively Twinkies. But for the general public, if you are eating garbage, yes, caloric restriction is probably a good thing. If you are eating garbage, is resveratrol good for you? It may have a benefit, but most of the people who are this far down the rabbit hole with me are optimizing so many pieces of their life. And I think in those people, the studies with resveratrol, the studies with caloric restriction have no relevance. And there's no evidence that metformin, resveratrol, NMN, which is nicotinamide mononucleotide, or any of these quote unquote longevity hacks have any benefit. And conversely, they may have significant harm in those of you who are doing other things right, which is why I've always said, just keep it simple. Start with an evolutionarily appropriate diet. If you've listened to my work in the past, you may know that I believe this is something that is blueprinted for us by hunter-gatherer tribes that seek meat, that seek organs, first of all, that get fruit seasonally, that get honey when they can have it, and will only go toward vegetables, roots and stems, leaves and seeds when they are otherwise starving. Obviously, there are no processed foods in wild human populations, so that is out of the equation completely. And as I've talked about in my recent Instagram reels and on previous podcasts, we know very clearly that ultra-processed foods are a nightmare for humans. I don't think anyone could legitimately argue that foods that contain processed grains, that are devoid of good bioavailable nutrients, that contain seed oils, or that contain processed sugars are healthy for humans. 
but we must dig down a little further into the nuance. We truly want to understand how to thrive as humans. Let's look at a summary of the calorie restriction on monkeys. As you heard in the previous paper, calorie restriction in monkeys is only beneficial when the control group is fed garbage. As one of my friends said, crap in a bag. If you feed monkeys garbage food, the equivalent of the human diet, then yes, calorie restricting them may be beneficial. And primates are interesting because they are closer to us evolutionarily than something like mice or worms. But when you really look at this data carefully, what you'll find is that if monkeys are fed evolutionarily appropriate food, there is no benefit to calorie restriction. And as the previous abstract pointed out, we know that hunger, nutrient deficiency, sarcopenia, which is inadequate muscle mass as we age related to inadequate protein. I'll talk about that a lot later in this podcast. All of these are harmful for humans. So in the most respectful way possible, I will say, show me someone in the longevity community who has adequate muscle mass, who has a six pack, who has muscles and is not sarcopenic because that is the result of that type of living. If you avoid leucine, if you avoid methionine, if you avoid meat and organs, and you practice caloric restriction or you practice intermittent fasting to a extreme degree, you will lose muscle mass and you will make yourself more susceptible to age-related disease of decrepitude. So I'll get to that in a moment, but let's look at this study on monkeys. Title of this paper is Caloric Restriction Improves Health and Survival of Rhesus Monkeys. That's a little bit of a misleading title. CR, caloric restriction, without malnutrition, extends lifespan and delays the onset of age-related disorders in most species, but its impact in non-human primates has been controversial. In the late 1980s, two parallel studies were initiated to determine the effects of caloric restriction in rhesus monkeys. The University of Wisconsin study reported a significant positive impact of caloric restriction on survival, but the National Institutes of Aging study detected no significant survival effect. And why is there a difference between those two studies? Because in the University of Wisconsin study, they fed the monkeys garbage. (laughs) They fed the monkeys processed garbage monkey chow. And in that case, caloric restriction showed a survival advantage. In the National Institute of Aging study, they did not do that. They fed the monkeys an evolutionarily appropriate diet, leaves, stems, roots, bugs, a little bit of meat, this sort of thing. And in that situation, caloric restriction was actually harmful for the monkeys. It had no benefit. So what do we see here? I don't think that the longevity community, in quotes, is presenting people with an accurate picture of what we know about caloric restriction, what the data show, whether it's in C. elegans, which is a worm, mice, rhesus monkeys, or in humans, and they're overselling the benefits of being hungry and malnourished. What about in humans? Really, probably the best trial is the calorie trial, two years of caloric restriction cardiometabolic risk, exploratory outcomes of a multi-center phase two randomized controlled trial. This is the calorie trial spelled C-A-L-E-R-I-E. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see the conclusions here. Two years of moderate calorie restriction. They say 25% calorie restricted diet significantly reduced multiple cardiometabolic risk factors in young non-obese individuals. But the problem here is if you look at the study, these people did clearly have fat to lose and they were not healthy at baseline. Though they might not have had a body mass index that put them in the obese range, if you look at the study, they say BMI ranged from 22.0 to 27.9. Well, the top end of that is clearly a population that does have an overweight phenotype. So these were not healthy people. They tried to couch this saying, slightly overweight, young, and middle-aged individuals. If you look at these two... (laughs) If you look at these two groups on this next page, the ad libitum group, which is just science speak for it gets to eat as much as they want versus the calorie restricted group, the body fat average was 32.9% respectively. Those are not healthy individuals in any way, shape or form. So anyone that sells the calorie trial as showing that caloric restriction has benefits in healthy individuals hasn't read the paper carefully enough. So we don't have a trial in humans. I'll repeat, there are no trials in humans and there probably will never be trials in humans looking at calorie restriction 
in individuals that are not obese, that are not pre-diabetic, that do not have chronic insulin resistance likely at baseline. And as we've seen in rhesus monkeys, when you do that trial, they do not benefit from caloric restriction. Why are we not surprised? Before I move on to talking about mTOR and leucine and methionine, I want to talk a little bit about mice and what they eat. As I was thinking about all of this data, I became curious to think, has anyone ever done a trial in mice where they eat their actual evolutionarily appropriate diet? And the answer is really no, because the majority of mice in studies are inbred. Some of them are bred to be fatter than others. We're not looking at wild type rats and we're not giving them the foods they would eat in nature. We're giving them soybean meal, we're giving them sugars. In fact, I even looked at this and I found some articles showing what we feed rats in these studies. So you can see here, uh, laboratory mice and rats, it gives an overview of their use in biomedical research and the type of diets they are fed. These are different types of strains of rats, which means they are basically um, inbred. So we have different types of rats, different types of mice, and there are different types of diets that these mice can eat, mice and rats can eat. You can see here in this publication, they say choice of laboratory animal diet influences intestinal health. Of course it influences intestinal health. It influences the entire health of the animals. So they say here, in addition, chows frequently contain non-nutritive but biologically active components, such as phytoestrogens, toxic heavy metals such as arsenic, at biologically relevant levels. There can be changes in composition of ingredients from one batch to the next, not possible to maintain consistent nutrient and non-nutrient profiles between batches or studies using chow. It is important to note there are typically very high levels of both soluble and insoluble fiber in chow, making up approximately 20% of the chow coming from multiple sources. Batches can vary from one manufacturer to another, and many of the ingredients are proprietary. They say, commonly described standard chow contains grain or cereal-based diets, ingredients such as soybean meal, ground corn, fish, and animal byproducts. They are closed formulas. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the pictures of standard animal chow. Well, unfortunately, I think most human food is starting to look like this today, and that's a real problem. And this is definitely what dog food looks like. So if you saw a recent video that I posted to Instagram, I compared the way my dog, Ribeye, looks. Healthy, good coat, moist nose, no plaque on his teeth at all, and I never brush his teeth, to the way a friend's dog looks, who's basically fat and eats the dog equivalent of mice chow. And that dog is unhealthy, not as good a coat, teeth not good, breath isn't good. So it's clear that if you feed animals, whether it's mice, monkeys, dogs, or humans, the proper diet, there's a big difference in the way that we perform as individuals. That creates a very large difference in the context of all of these experimental studies. They go on to talk about a purified diet, which looks a little bit less bad, but still uh, basically garbage for animals. So when we are thinking about mouse studies, it's important to understand that there has never been a mouse study that I'm aware of, and if any of you know of a study like this, please send it to me because I would love to talk about it. There's never been a mouse study that compared caloric restriction or any of these interventions in mice that were eating what mice eat in the wild, which is bugs, dead animals, carry on, uh, a little bit of probably leaves and berries and who knows, but soybean meal, rotten fish, I don't think so. Cornmeal, I don't think mice are eating too much corn. They're definitely not eating seed oils or soybeans at the level that they're found in those products. So we have flawed context for all of this. And I think that comes to light when you look at those two studies of rhesus monkeys, the Wisconsin versus the National Institutes of Aging. But I've never heard anyone in the longevity community talk about that fact. So let's move on to talking about mTOR because that is something that David Sinclair refers to in that short clip on Lex Friedman's podcast. And he says, you want to restrict these type of foods that are going to trigger mTOR. He says it a little bit later. I don't think I included that actual part of the clip, but mTOR is a big problem. And as the person who emailed me said, restriction of certain amino acids might affect mTOR. As I said earlier, mTOR is an acronym which stands for the mechanistic target of rapamycin. It is a kinase, which means it phosphorylates other things in the cell and turns on pathways, in this case, anabolic pathways leading to growth and repair. Well, 
here is why I don't think you should fear mTOR. At a high level, mTOR is essential for life. If you want to be vital, if you want muscle, you want mTOR turned on from time to time. You probably don't want mTOR turned on all the time. And unless you're eating 24 hours a day, it's not going to be turned on all the time. It shuts off after you stop eating. Let's talk about the dietary inputs that turn mTOR on. There's a great paper that I've spoken about in the past that I've also never seen anyone talk about in the longevity community. What's interesting here is that leucine specifically, a branch chain amino acid that is found predominantly in meat that is essential for muscle protein synthesis, something I think is very good, especially as we age, is really painted as the main culprit here. So most of these longevity quote experts will urge you to eat either low methionine, another amino acid, or low leucine diets. But when you actually look at the research, leucine is not the only thing that turns on mTOR. So this is a paper called The Actions of Exogenous Leucine on mTOR Signaling and Amino Acid Transporters in Human Myotubes. The title of the paper is less important than this graphic partway through the paper, which I will focus on right here. If you're not watching this on YouTube, what you see here is that while leucine will turn on mTOR, insulin also turns on the mechanistic target of rapamycin. Yes, a protein hormone released when we eat carbohydrates turns on mTOR. And in this study using human myotubes, there is a statistically significant difference with insulin being a stronger activator of mTOR at 30 minutes, about equivalent at two hours and at 24 hours. But consider this, if you're going to avoid leucine by avoiding red meat and organs and only eating plant protein, what are you going to eat? Because you also can't eat carbohydrates because that will increase insulin and that will also trigger mTOR. mTOR is a very difficult thing to measure in real time, but I'm betting, according to this study, which is well done and very clear, that if we measured mTOR in any of these longevity experts after they eat, unless they're eating a meal that is solely composed of fat, their mTOR is going to be equivalent to mine after I eat a meal of steak and liver and heart because they're going to get postprandial insulin and I'm going to get leucine and insulin. So I don't think there's any good evidence that you can avoid mTOR with the foods you eat unless you want to do a diet that is exclusively made of fat. And the last time I checked, these longevity experts aren't eating animal fats. They're not eating butter and tallow. That sounds like a very bland diet. They're going to have to eat plant fats based on their mental construct, which means they're going to eat seed oils. But of course, nobody's doing this. You must eat carbohydrates or protein. I think you should eat both. And both of those are going to activate mTOR. You know what else activates mTOR? Exercise. So tell me again why we're scared of this and why the longevity community keeps hammering on the notion that you don't want to activate mTOR, because I think activating mTOR by doing resistance exercise or surfing or sprinting is a very good thing. Here's a paper by Kurt Watson and Keith Barr, mTOR and the health benefits of exercise. And they say in the abstract, it is not surprising that exercise training is known to prevent or effectively treat a multitude of degenerative conditions, including cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, depression, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and many others. Many of the health benefits, of course, are mediated by the mammalian slash mechanistic target of rapamycin, either in complex one or complex two, not only within working muscle, but also in distant tissues such as fat, liver, and brain. I think I should read that again so that you guys understand the gravity of that statement. Many of the health benefits of exercise for all of those conditions I just listed, diabetes, cancer, depression, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, are mediated, I'm reading from the abstract of this paper, by mTOR, either at complex one or complex two, which is part of the mTOR cascade, within working muscle, but also in fat, liver, and brain. So if you're a longevity expert, not only should you not eat carbohydrates because they'll spike your insulin and that'll turn on mTOR, or meat and organs full of nutrients because that contains leucine and that will spike your mTOR, you also can't exercise because that is going to turn on your mTOR, which as the authors of this paper point out, is the mechanistic reason 
that exercise has benefits for so many of these chronic diseases. I hope at this point in the podcast, these arguments of the longevity community are starting to look as frail as, well, I don't know. They're starting to look pretty darn frail when you actually look at the research and how all of this works. I just don't understand why members of this community can't be more honest and present a more comprehensive picture of what's going on here. Before I move on to talking about methionine, I really want to talk about leucine for a moment. So leucine is a branched chain amino acid that often gets vilified, but there's very good evidence that leucine is essential for optimal human health, especially as we age. I'm going to read from an abstract. The title of the paper is Optimizing Adult Protein Intake During Catabolic Health Conditions. The last author is Don Lehman. Although the RDA for protein of 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight is adequate to avoid obvious inadequacies, multiple studies provide evidence that many adults may benefit from protein quantity, quality, and distribution beyond guidelines currently defined by the RDA. Further, the dietary requirement for protein is a surrogate for the constituent amino acids, in particular, the nine considered to be indispensable. Leucine provides an important example of an essential amino acid where the RDA of 42 milligrams per kilogram body weight is significantly less than the 100 to 110 milligrams per kilogram required to optimize metabolic regulation and skeletal muscle protein synthesis. So that is a very profound statement. If you do the calculation for yourself, 100 to 110 milligrams per kilogram of leucine is required to optimize skeletal muscle health and protein synthesis. And you want your skeletal muscle to be healthy. You do not want to be an under-muscled sarcopenic individual. Muscle is the main glucose disposal depot. Muscle is why we remain insulin sensitive, ultimately. If you don't have enough muscle, you're going to be frail. I'm gonna show you guys many studies showing the detriment, the very huge dangers of being sarcopenic. I hope none of you have a frail grandmother who's broken her hip, but if you do, then you understand clearly how dangerous it is to be under-muscled. You want to have lots of good quality muscle. You don't need to be a bodybuilder, but you want to have adequate lean muscle mass. And as Don Lehman in this paper clearly states, in order to optimize muscle protein synthesis dietarily, you must get 100 to 110 milligrams per kilogram of leucine in your diet. Well, let's think about this. I am 70 kilograms. I weigh about 165 pounds. I weigh myself every morning. 70 kilograms times 110 milligrams per kilogram, because I want to optimize this, is over seven grams of leucine in my diet per day. Now, I eat lots of meat, so getting seven grams of leucine is no problem for me at all. But if you listen to mainstream health authorities, what will they tell you about leucine? Let's see what Healthline says. I found this to be really ironic and very disappointing. Here's Healthline, 10 healthy high leucine foods. What's not on this list? Any guesses? Red meat, liver, organs, because Healthline doesn't think these things are healthy, which is bullshit. So they even say here, leucine is a branched chain amino acid like valine and isoleucine, and it's very helpful for building muscle and getting enough leucine may prevent muscle wasting in older adults. All great things. Leucine also appears to manage blood sugar levels. Wow, fantastic. Uh, the current recommended uh, recommendation for leucine is 25 milligrams per pound, 55 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, or approximately 4.4 grams per day for a 175 pound person. As Don Lehman points out, those are bullshit. <laughs> you must get 110 milligrams per kilogram to really optimize your levels of muscle protein synthesis. So fortunately, deficiency of this amino acid is rare because there are a wide array of foods that contain it. 10 high leucine foods. Canned navy beans, number one. 100 grams of navy beans contains 0.7 grams of leucine. Wait, I need to get seven grams of leucine. <laughs> which means I need to eat a kilogram of navy beans to get seven plus grams of leucine. That's impossible. Um, it's probably impossible for anyone to get enough leucine from navy beans or anything like that. Cottage cheese. Well, at least we're on an animal food here. 100 grams of cottage cheese has 1.27 grams of leucine. Okay, great. I include raw kefir in my diet, 
But if I want to get my leucine exclusively from dairy, like a vegetarian might, you're going to have to have 600 grams over a pound of cottage cheese every single day. These are healthy, high leucine foods. Sesame seeds, two tablespoons of dried sesame seeds, 0.25 grams of leucine. Well, you're going to need a hell of a lot of sesame seeds to get anywhere near seven grams. And even if you combine all these different foods in a day, you're not going to get there. Pumpkin seeds, one ounce of pumpkin seeds, 0.7 grams, okay? You're going to need to eat more than half a pound of pumpkin seeds every single day to get seven grams of leucine. Eggs, well, this is one I can get behind, but one extra large egg only has 0.6 grams of leucine. I think it's more likely you're going to eat 10 eggs in a day than a kilogram, 2.2 pounds of navy beans. Well, that's all the health line has for us, guys. Signing off, that's how you can be healthy. That's how you can get enough leucine to optimize your muscle protein synthesis. There's a glaring omission here. <laughs> the fact that red meat has so much more leucine than any of these other foods. A 100 gram portion of red meat, 2.5 grams of leucine. 2.5 grams of leucine. Nothing on Healthline's list other than the animal foods, the milk and the eggs were even close to that, even in the ballpark. And let me tell you, if I wanted to get seven grams of leucine, all I have to do is get 12 to 13 ounces of red meat a day, not even a pound. And if you've watched any of my stuff, you know that I eat far more than that in a day, between one and a half to one and three quarter pound of meat, a few ounces of organs, fresh, maybe some desiccated heart and soil supplements. It's so much easier to get the leucine that your body requires to have optimal muscle protein synthesis from animal foods. Good luck getting it from plant foods and most of the longevity community doesn't even want you to get enough leucine. Well, it's very clear that you need leucine because if you don't get enough leucine, then you're going to probably develop sarcopenia. And in fact, I will be again respectful, but say that most of the people in the longevity community look to be very sarcopenic. So here's an article, sarcopenia and frailty in geriatric patients, implications for training and prevention. Sarcopenia is the loss of muscle mass and strength. It's a constant phenomenon in aging. Well, not really. <laughs> It's only a constant phenomenon in aging when you're not eating enough animal foods like your biology is clearly telling you to. Another article, mitochondrial impairment in sarcopenia. Oh, you mean that if you don't get enough leucine, if you don't get enough protein from high quality sources, which are essentially animal foods, animal meat and organs, your mitochondria are going to be impaired? This longevity biz doesn't sound very good to me. <laughs> and as we know, empty promises abound here. Number one, I don't think there's any evidence that there's gonna be improved longevity in any of these situations. And it's clearly going to be damaging for us as humans. I honestly don't understand how this charade can continue much longer and I think it's harming a lot of people. Returning quickly to the paper by Don Lehman, I wanted to point out that the age-related reduction in the sensitivity of muscle protein synthesis to exercise or protein can be overcome with greater volumes of resistance exercise or greater doses of protein. So what's important to point out there is that as we age, the sensitivity of your muscles to turn on mTOR, something that is very good, is lowered, meaning you're going to need more exercise and more protein to turn it on, which we know is associated with all the benefits mechanistically I mentioned, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, et cetera, that huge list, you want to be turning on mTOR. You don't wanna be avoiding turning on mTOR. Yes, you will have AMPK turned on from time to time. That's the other side of sort of this anabolic, catabolic seesaw. But you must turn on mTOR if you want to thrive as you age. The research is very clear here. Here's an article titled, The Impact of Dietary Protein Intake on Longevity and Metabolic Health. What? Yes, this is an article talking about how dietary protein can improve longevity and metabolic health. Because if you get more protein in your diet, you are stronger and you actually have more longevity. But that's not the only article showing this. Here's another one. Very similar title, The Role of Dietary Protein on Muscular Fitness and Longevity in Aging. The article, the abstract says, muscle atrophy is an unfortunate effect of aging. Many diseases can compromise physical function and impair vital metabolic processes. Low levels of muscular fitness together with insufficient dietary intake are major risk factors for illness and mortality from all causes. What? 
How can the longevity community be so blind to all of this? A combined exercise program consisting of both resistance and endurance type exercise may help to ameliorate the loss of skeletal muscle mass and function. And in addition, the use of dietary protein supplementation, or you could just eat real meat and organs, augment protein anabolism, but can also contribute to a more active lifestyle, thereby supporting well-being and active aging in older populations. I'm going to say it here right now, guys. There is absolutely no evidence that having adequate protein, being adequately muscled, and turning on your mTOR decreases longevity. In fact, to the contrary, there is very good evidence that all of these things improve your longevity. The last piece of this equation that I want to talk about briefly is the methionine issue, because there are many people who would point out that in animal studies, like mice, when you restrict methionine, mice live longer. What they don't tell you is that there is a delicate balance between two amino acids, methionine and glycine. Those of you who are familiar with my podcast and my work have heard me talk about this in the past. There's a delicate balance between these two amino acids. And if you give animals, at least, and probably people, too much methionine without giving them enough glycine, that could be harmful. But unfortunately, the longevity community conflates the presence of methionine in muscle meat with getting too much methionine. Well, we know very clearly that muscle meat contains glycine as well. In fact, there's more glycine in muscle meat than there is methionine. If you average across different cuts of beef, for instance, 2%-ish methionine and around 6 to 7% glycine in these meats. So even in a cut of steak, there's more glycine than methionine. I don't think we know what the optimal ratio of glycine to methionine is for humans, but collagenous tissues, bone broths, these types of things have 25, 30% glycine to much lower amounts of methionine, maybe 0.5%. So perhaps somewhere between those two is a happy medium because I think that we should eat collagenous tissues in our diet in addition to muscle meats. But most muscle meat, especially something like a hamburger, has collagenous tissues ground into it. When you're eating that steak, you wanna eat the grizzly bits. If you can't eat the grizzly bits of a steak, make sure you're getting some bone broth or some sort of collagenous tissue in the diet. At Heart and Soil, we make skin, hair, and nails, which has a special type of collagen from scapula and trachea that is particularly beneficial. However you get the collagen into your diet, get collagen in addition to your muscle meat, but that will balance the methionine and glycine. The key point here is that if you give animals adequate glycine, there's no problem with methionine in their diet. Here's a paper, the title, Glycine Supplementation Extends Lifespan of male and female mice. Oh, imagine that. <laughs> that if you just give glycine to mice to balance out the excess methionine in these crap in a bag synthetic diets, they live longer. Well, that's easy to do as humans. You can just get some collagen, you can chew on a bone, you can eat the collagenous tissues, you can eat the tendons on your tomahawk, whatever you want to do. Now, another article that I'll point out that I find very interesting. Deficient synthesis of glutathione underlies oxidative stress and aging and can be corrected by dietary cysteine and glycine supplementation. The authors of this paper believe that as we age, the increase in oxidative stress is related to deficiency of cysteine and glycine. And that is because those amino acids are critical to make glutathione. Glutathione is a three amino acid peptide, glutamate, cysteine, and glycine. So these authors believe that if you supplement with cysteine and glycine as you age, you can improve your glutathione levels and that can help ameliorate oxidative stress. Where do you get cysteine and glycine? Well, you can take a supplement, but you could also get them from food. Animal foods would probably be the best source. So I think that most humans living today are not getting enough cysteine or glycine because they're not eating enough animal products. In case it hasn't been clear at this point in the podcast, I'll just say very clearly, I think one of the reasons that we age, that we become chronically ill, is because we don't eat enough meat and organs. And I will let that stand in stark contradistinction to what the longevity community claims to be ideal for living long and well. The problem with many of these claims is also that we're going to have to wait 60 or 70 years to see how many of these longevity folks are still around and how good they look compared to folks like me who are just gonna keep eating tons of meat and organs for the next 60 to 70 years of our lives. So 
We'll find out. Hopefully, most of you will still be in the audience at that time, and we'll see who is still standing. But I think that the medical literature is very clear here. Caloric restriction, bullshit. Probably of no benefit in healthy individuals. There are no studies in humans that show that. There is a clear distinction between crap-fed rhesus macaw monkeys and well-fed rhesus macaw monkeys that makes a very strong point there. And the same thing is true in mice, depending on what strain you use. The benefits of caloric restriction are probably almost certainly related to weight loss. Refer back to the previous podcasts I've done on how to lose weight if you have questions about how to get there. If you are obese, if you are diabetic, yes, restricting your calories is a good thing if you're eating crap, but I think that you will lose weight and get all of the same benefits without restricting your calories, as I talked about in previous podcasts, if you just improve the quality of your food. And one of the things we know for sure is that calorie restriction is not a panacea. It comes with all sorts of hormonal negatives. Hormones will decline. All sorts of nutritional problems can arise. So calorie restriction is not a good long-term strategy for weight loss. I'll just say it, which is why I hate things like Weight Watchers, which do nothing to improve food quality. They're full of grains. They're full of seed oils. They're just methods to reduce calories. If that's the only way you can lose weight, yes, that's fine. But it drives me crazy that my dad still drinks Glucerna. That helped him lose weight in the past, probably by helping with satiety, but it's full of soybean oil. Dad, you must improve the quality of your diet. Who knows if he'll listen to this. I'll also point out that one of the problems people have with high methionine diets is IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one. Refer back to the podcasts I've done looking at my blood work to show that my IGF-1 is lower than the average American. And I eat a pound and a half plus of meat per day. I eat dairy. I eat all of these things that are supposed to raise my IGF-1, but I remain insulin sensitive. I still am waiting for some of these longevity experts to show me what their IGF-1 is because I believe mine is on the same level as theirs or even lower. So let's return to the Mayo Clinic's claims. So the Mayo Clinic video I showed in the beginning said they reviewed six studies, the epidemiology studies, which show that eating meat is associated with increased mortality. It's gonna worsen your longevity. The problem with these studies is consistently healthy user bias, and on the flip side, more importantly, in this case, unhealthy user bias. What people will not tell you in Western medicine is that there are many studies that do not show any benefit to excluding meat from your diet and in fact show harm many cases. These studies are often conveniently left out of these discussions. Here's a study, vegetarian diet and all-cause mortality, evidence from a large population study based in Australia, the 45 and up study. Conclusions, this is a quarter of a million participants. We found no evidence that following a vegetarian diet or semi-vegetarian diet or a pesco-vegetarian diet has an independent protective effect on all-cause mortality. Again, we're just looking at epidemiology here, but I want to show you guys that there is a clear body of literature that does not support any of these claims about the benefits of a vegetarian or vegan or pesco-vegetarian diet and doesn't show any harm to red meat. Meat intake and cause-specific mortality, a pooled analysis of Asian prospective cohort studies. Again, this one is over 300,000 Asian men and women. Our pooled analysis did not provide evidence of a higher risk of mortality for total meat intake and provided evidence of an inverse association with red meat, poultry, and fish seafood. This is the kicker. Get ready for this, guys. Red meat intake was inversely associated with cardiovascular disease mortality in men and with cancer mortality in women in Asian countries. What? <laughs> of course, there's tons of evidence like this. One more, just for good measure. Often these longevity experts will point to blue zones or Okinawan diets and say they're low in meat and they live a long time. But what they won't tell you is what is known from this study, Nutrition for the Japanese Elderly. What they found in this study was that the Okinawans actually ate more meat than their Japanese cohorts because Buddhism was not a thing there and meat was not shunned. And when they looked for centenarians, they didn't find any among the vegetarians. Unexpectedly, we did not find any vegetarians among the centenarians. Oh, the next time someone tells you that Okinawans eat a plant-based diet, show them this study because they are speaking incorrect things. They're not speaking the truth. Okinawans eat more meat than their parallel Japanese cohorts. And in this study, they did not find any centenarians among the vegetarians. Well, that stands in stark contradistinction to what we're often told. 
So I think at this point, I hope that I've made a case in opposition to what David Sinclair was saying, to what these ivory tower experts at the Mayo Clinic were saying about red meat and how the benefits of red meat are transient or immediate, but long-term you're making a sacrifice. And I hope the person that sent me this email watches this podcast and sees that I'm answering this question. I don't think that I am making any sacrifice in terms of my longevity by eating meat and organs. In fact, I think I'm improving it on a day-to-day basis. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me that the human organism would work in a way that's something that is clearly beneficial. Improved testosterone, improved estrogen if you're a woman, progesterone, all of the hormones, improved libido, improved vitality, improved virility in an immediate reaction to these foods. But long-term, it's bad for you? That doesn't make any sense. These are sort of these twisted voodoo gymnastics narratives that don't make any sense. And I think that the last thing I'll close with is a question. And this question was posed by Matt Kaberlein, the author of the science study, giving a review of mouse caloric restriction and animal model caloric restriction and saying that there are many holes in this data at the beginning of this podcast. He said, do we know that the diet that we evolved on is the optimal diet for humans? And I think it's an important question to consider. I believe the answer to that question is yes. What better indicator do we have for what the optimal diet for humans could be than what we evolved eating? Isn't this how natural selection and evolution in humans works? Remember that we were homo sapiens for 350,000 years, and before that we were homo erectus, homo habilis, and australopithecines. We have 4 million or so years of human hominid and pre-hominid evolution. We have a pretty clear anthropologic record showing that we ate more meat, and that may have been the spark that improved our nutrition and led to increases in the size of our brains. We know that our brains increased 2 million years ago. There are theories this was aliens. There are theories this was mushrooms. I think the most compelling narrative is that we were eating more meat and getting unique nutrients into our bodies that allowed for this to happen. I've spoken about this in the past with regard to the expensive tissue hypothesis, the idea that our large intestines shrank, our small intestines increased in size to absorb the increased nutrient density of the foods we were eating. And that energetic trade-off allowed for our brains to grow. This is a very compelling hypothesis. But I would love to have this conversation with Matt Kaberlein. He doesn't think that the foods we evolved eating are necessarily the most optimal foods for humans. But what else is there? What could be optimal for humans if not the foods that we evolved eating? Are we really believing that a Soylent, that a synthetic, that a 3D printed steak is going to be optimal for humans? Are we really believing that Impossible Burger or Beyond Burger is the optimal food for humans? There's clear evidence that's not the case. And we have great anthropologic and ethnographic evidence that when we as humans transitioned from a diet that was a hunter-gatherer diet to a pastoralist diet with more grains, our health went into the toilet. This is the work of George Amalagos at the Dixon Mounds paper is titled Disease and Death, the Dixon Mounds. It's a very interesting read, but you can find very clearly when you read this paper that in this Ohio Spoon River Valley, the skeletal remains of prehistoric Native Americans show that agricultural revolutions can be hazardous to your health. I'm reading from the paper. So it's very clear that what we've ended up eating as humans is not ideal for us. We're obviously a very unhealthy group of people. So Why would it not be the case that the foods available to wild humans, meat, organs, fruit, honey, and perhaps tubers and vegetables as survival fallback foods, but not optimal foods, those are probably the best foods for humans to eat. I'm not a fan of eating vegetables because of the plant defense chemicals. I did a podcast two weeks ago talking specifically about plant defense chemicals and why I don't include them in my diet, why I try and avoid them as much as possible. But look, If you're eating vegetables along with your meat and organs, that is way better than eating ultra processed foods or eating tons of grains. So I would say that I believe the diet we evolved eating as humans is the best diet for us. That's what natural selection evolution does. And what could be better than that for us as humans? That's how we refined ourselves. Those are the people who were selected over time to reproduce, to be the strongest. I think it's very likely that our genes expect and quote unquote hope obviously I'm anthropomorphizing here, for us to eat a diet that is like what the Hadza crave. They wanna eat meat, they wanna eat organs, they wanna hunt animals. When they get honey, they eat it, they eat ripe fruit, and they don't really care about vegetables at all. 
They may dig tubers, but mostly that's something that the women do. The men don't care about it at all. And if they're starving, they'll eat more tubers. If they're really starving, they might eat a few leaves. They might eat a few seeds. But the vegetables, the roots, the stems, the leaves, and the seeds of plants are clearly fallback foods. I've shown a paper that has that exact title in the past, Tubers as Fallback Foods for Humans. That paper by Frank Marlowe, who studied the Hadza at length, clearly ranks the foods in order of what the Hadza prefer. Both men and women like honey the most. Then they eat meat and organs, berries, baobab fruit, and tubers are dead last on both of their lists of the most preferred foods. I think that is the best estimation of what the optimal diet is for humans. And do not restrict protein. Do not restrict leucine, methionine. Do not do caloric restriction if you want to thrive long-term. I think that the true way to longevity is to get those foods in your diet. And I look forward to engaging discussions with people from the longevity community and hope that they will be willing to show up for some discussions so that we can share information and advance the collective knowledge that all of you will benefit in the future.